right, everyone. Welcome back. Good to see you. Another episode of Revisiting the Road to Serfdom. We're going to be doing something a little different that we did uh, from other episodes um, because this chapter, quite frankly, well, I guess we did this in the last one too. My, my guess is this is going to become the norm is that we're going to be doing probably one chapter per episode um, like we did with the last one. Um, but this one, we're going to be talking about planning and the rule of law. Uh, so if you remember last time, chapter uh, five, we discussed um, planning and democracy. And one of the kind of through lines through, through the book generally is where Hayek kind of lays out the incompatibilities uh, between planning and all of these other things that are fundamental to a liberal society. Um, and so last time it was about democracy. This time he's going through planning and the rule of law. But to kind of recap uh, the previous chapter, for those of you who uh, might have missed it, um, one of the things he talks about is, okay, like in a, in a democratic society, that's based on this notion of consensus. You know, if you were, if, if you're going to go back and watch the previous video, um, you might want to play a game called take a shot every time Truman says either consensus or coercion, um, because that, that word comes up a lot. Uh, but the last chapter deals with what do you do when you don't have consensus, because you're not going to get it under planning. And so Hayek is saying, look, they think they might be able to get this, but they're not going to. So then they're going to have to deal with that. Uh, the reality that most people don't agree with what their plan is. And so they have to circumvent um, the will of the people generally. And so a couple of the ways they do that is through unelected bureaucratic committees. Um, they'll use vague terminology to describe what their plan is. So they'll talk about the common good or the common welfare. One of the um, things I said that, that might map onto today would be um, X is a human right. Um, another thing they'll do is they'll just use force and like ignore, uh, the will of the people. And one of the ways they might do that is by ignoring proper elections. Uh, so one of the things that they kind of talk about, you know, thinking out loud a little bit is okay. If a labor government puts all these policies in place, um, to try and make planning permanent society, move them towards socialism, what happens if the will of the people is to vote them out of office, um, and so they were like, well, we might have to come up with some guarantees to make sure that this new government can't undo all of our progress, which is to say the will of the people can't undo all of our progress if they decide they don't want to go along with it. And then another thing they'll do is like, look, they'll probably create policies that remove any limits on their authority. So they, they can use these democratic methods. We talk about democratic socialism and, and so on and so forth um, to remove any restrictions on their uh on their ability to to govern um you know and one of the distinctions that we discussed last time was look the u.s constitution is is all about um the freedom from the force of the government and <clears throat> that's totally uh, the exact opposite of what planning is because they remove any restrictions on, on their powers and one of the quotes that's from last chapter that has really stuck with me is that it's not about the way in which a, uh, a government gains power, um, but what limits that power, right? So you can vote yourself into despotism. You can vote yourself into a, a place of total servitude by just electing a, an authoritarian dictator. Um, so it's not, the, and that's democratic, you know, there. So democratic socialism, you know, whatever. Um, it's not the means in which the power, like, comes to power, but it's what are the limits on that power that matters. And that's what kind of tees up this chapter uh, on the rule of law is because he's saying, here is how they use the rule of law to remove their, their own power and how they instantiate a lot of these crazy policies into law. Um, so I don't know, Kevin, is that, is that about sum it up I, um, in terms of chapter five? Did I miss anything? No, man, you hit on a lot of key points there. You know, it's the, 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 war call of the conservative now is like the limited government piece, you know, limited government yep. is extremely important. And I, I, I do want to tease this out because we normally go through this at the beginning of every chapter. Limited government is a liberal idea, liberal mm -hmm. in the 19th century European sense of liberal, where you want uh, the least amount of government coercion as possible to allow people to act as free actors. Um, whereas we think of liberal in the American sense, that is completely the opposite. That means I want to introduce as much government coercion uh, so I have less responsibilities for my life and, and everyone can be taken care of. So that is a very important distinction, although I don't think liberal even comes up anywhere in the text 
here, but I know we're probably going to talk about it quite a bit uh, throughout this chapter review. Yep. Yeah. And uh, to, I'm thank you for reminding me. Yeah. There's a few, at least two words we have to define probably at the beginning of every episode. Um, one of them is liberal as Hayek uses it in the classical sense, you know, think conservative, think maybe libertarian a little bit um, whenever you hear that word. And the other one is, is planning, you know, which is this book. Whenever you hear planning, think about like a top down, government control of all of the facets of society. So they would use planning as this kind of term to describe whatever it is, you know, that they thought was the right thing. But planning was just, instead of people having the freedom to choose, someone above is going to choose for them. Um, so this, you know, these, you know, uh, uh, what are they called? Uh, philosopher Kings are going to make these decisions for an entire society and plan the way the society runs, you know, from the economic exchanges, those aren't going to be for anymore to the way the law is applied, whatever. Um, and so whenever you hear planning, think socialism, um, think total government control, um, think, think the opposite of, of freedom of choice as an individual, to be honest. Um, but that's another one that, that it, it's kind of fallen out of fashion in our you know, contemporary vernacular, but there are definitely like one for one comparisons. So again, I would say socialism or democratic socialism, um, progressivism, I think would be another one that would be right in line with the basic idea of planning. Um, anyway, so thank yeah. thank you for reminding me that yeah. uh, I totally spaced. That's a good clarification because planning, I think, you know, I mean, I'm trying to think of what word we use now today, just all the time. Uh, that is the kind of light, fluffy version of socialism. Like they used to use the word socialism. Then everyone's like, oh, that's a bad thing. So we're going to go to planning now. You know, for an <laughs> actual democracy, it's like, all right, we're going to use planning. It's another softer term. We don't hear that anymore today. And it's probably been plast or replaced by some sort of generic progressivism, right? So there's always a word that, I mean, he talks about in a previous chapter where socialism is not going to go away. It'll just come back under a different name. Planning was one of those names. Now the new name today could be, you know, social the you know democratic socialism which is something that they did kind of say back then i don't know if hayek realized how much that get caught on today but there's always kind of this evolution of these terms to kind of mean the same thing but they know they need to rebrand it because the last revision of of that term has uh been completely uh blown apart no one wants to be associated with yep. that right that makes sense yep. yeah do you think so just to piggyback on what you just said do you think that the contemporary version of that would be to just use the words do something in a sentence? We need to do something or take action. We need to do something about climate change. We need to take action on systemic racism. We need to do something about COVID, you know, or whatever. Like that's a, those are, it's, it's time to take action or it's time to do something or address. Address is another word. We have to address this thing. You know, I, I know that those are terms that are pretty ubiquitous. But you really only see them being used in the context of like progressive policy prescriptions that are just wide sweeping um, expansions of government power. So, I mean, you got me thinking there. So I don't know. Do you think that that would be yeah. um, like because so, even if you look at the executive orders and stuff that I was uh, talking about earlier that we'll you know pull up here later um, – a lot of those have to do with like, in order to address X, mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah. is, is here's what we're going to do. Um, well, just think about maybe it. Even would be another thing that might be used for planning because it, it requires force. Um, it requires action. Well, I think equity is a, a part of planning. Um, but, but to go on to your take action bit, I mean, think about what planning is. Planning is like, okay, we need a, a centralized power to plan this because what's the opposite of planning? What's the absence of planning to them? It's like chaos. To us, that's a free market. That's free exchange is, is the lack of planning, lack of coercion. So I think the take action is actually a really, really good um, comparison to today because what is the opposite of taking action? Well, it's not taking action. It's the government sitting there not doing anything. And to a lot of the you know self-prescribed liberals of today or really the progressives of today, that's a nightmare. Whereas to most of us, the true liberals, the conservatives, the independents, the, the uh, libertarians, that's, that's heaven, right? I don't want you to take action. You know, that's lack of planning, lack of action. And to them, it's like, oh, it's, it's going to be chaos. If we can't tell you what to do, how are you guys going to know what to do? It's treating the, the people as children rather than, you know, your, your, uh, your represent or the people that you are representing. Yeah, yeah. I mean – I don't know if I have anything to add to that other yeah. than, other than yeah. I agree. I know I mean, we're I already that, like sidetracked compared to where you're going to start on right. this one. But oh, I yeah. do think it's a, a good thing to tease out a little bit there. 
But, it is. Uh, and, you know, and honestly, part of that is I was uh, at the tail end of what you were talking about there. I pulled up the Green New Deal because I wanted to see what their, uh, what their wording was. <laughs> um, and yeah. it's, it's the same thing. It's the sense that it's the duty of the federal government to create a Green New Deal um, to achieve this, um, to uh, invest. So, I mean, those are terms that they're not really using, um, mm -hmm. at least in that. But I, I think that the, the general point you made is correct and that there are there's got to be ways in which I think it's important for people to key into like, yeah, this is an aside here that we're on right now, but it's important for people like, I mean, CRT is one of those things. People need to hear horror when they hear that socialism is people need to hear no, like terrible, like servitude. Right. And so for all of these things, like if, if there is this term like planning here that, you know, I guarantee you Hayek, whenever you heard someone say we need planning, he was like, Oh God, like, you know, that put a pit in his stomach. And so we do need to identify those contemporary versions of these ideas because, I mean, like you said, some of them have gone away, some of them have been whitewashed, um, and some of them have been replaced with other, you know, social justice or whatever thing. So um, I think that does matter. Anyway, sorry for the distraction, but um, yeah. uh, continue on. I mean, the, the, so the, with the, the, the next quote about. Right. So, the, I mean, the name of the last chapter, chapter five, was planning and democracy. The name of this chapter is uh, planning and the rule of law. So planning is involved with both. So I think it's a good thing to, to tease that out at the beginning. But um, the first quote or context I'm going to take from the book actually comes toward the end of the chapter. But it does really fit nice and neatly between these two when you're bridging the planning and democracy and planning and the rule of law. Because, you know, the previous chapter talks about the incapab incompatibility between planning and democracy and how a democracy needs that. Uh, limited or restricted power, but even a democracy needs to temporarily put those powers aside in times of war, right? So think of this time of war as a, a temporary state of planning, I guess. So even though this is a necessity, advocates of planning will use this temporary condition to justify a permanent permanent economic planning solution. So that's what we don't want to get into. And that's what he, he puts toward the back of the chapter, but I think it's good to tease it out now. I think we've also talked about this in the introduction. He, he teased out a little bit because remember this is written in 44. Um, yep. And then after 44, he got to see, okay, we're out of this war. And why are we not taking these wartime, um, you know, plans out of the economy? You know, people are just like, well, it worked during war. Yep. I guess it works now. So this, this kind of teased it out a little bit. So he actually starts out with a, a quote from the economist. So quote, uh, democratic government, no less than dictatorship, must always have plenary powers in pose, which just means uh, in potential, but not in actuality, without sacrificing their democratic and representative character. And then he continues by saying, uh, plenary powers may be inevitable in wartime, which, of course, even free and open criticism is necessarily restricted. Back then, it was more criticism that restricted, but now think of it as, um, you know, it would would add uh, any coercive power of government, for example, like uh, using their manufacturing resources uh, currently uh, in use and switching them over to wartime resources in some form of economic planning. It's kind of how you can see it but today. So tell me the quote, but the always in the, st in the statement quoted does not suggest that the economist regards it as a regrettable wartime necessity. Yet as a permanent institution, this view is certainly incompatible with the preservation of the rule of law, and it leads straight to a totalitarian state. It is, however, the view which all those who want government to, to direct economic life must hold. So I think that the two big things that I take away from this quote is something I took away kind of at the beginning when, when he teased it out you know, in the introduction is one that we shouldn't use a temporary wartime condition for a permanent economic solution. Like why, why would you use something that's meant to be temporary or meant to fit in this little window in this, this particular situation and say, okay, well, since it fits in this particular situation, let's just expand it and use this as our, our permanent economic solution. Like that's, that's crazy. Why would you use it? You know, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense in that way. And two, this is a permanent state of government coercion, which will, will inevitably lead to, tal to totalitarianism. Um, you know, it's allowing these plenary powers where the government kind of just dip in whenever it feels it's necessary and we even use or we even see this which covered in a, a previous chapter of this this language of war right the war on drugs the war on poverty the war on terrorism all of these this language is used to say all right well we're going to take this power temporarily and if we think we're, we're in a time of war even though you know no one's shooting a gun right now when we're in times of war yep. we're going to take this over overbearing course of power and we're going to use it to try to to crush whatever the proverbial enemy is at that time and that can that is directly how do you go to to, to a totalitarian state and it's something we really need to key in on when we kind of hear that language 
Yep. And, and to piggyback on that, you know, the enemy, real or imagined, right? Um, and part of using that uh, wartime vernacular to address non-war situations, one of the things that is in that introduction is that you're like, hey, look, savvy politicians will use this as a way to, to create a situation where there's no logical endpoint to them not having the power anymore. You know, the Milton Friedman quote, there's nothing quite as permanent as a temporary government program. And so like what he's saying there is like, look, they, they're going to come up with these ways to deceive you into thinking that this is necessary right now. Like they've seen how war, I mean, to you, again, you referenced in the introduction, um, these people who are already in the mindset of planning are looking and going, oh, the entire economy is being commandeered by the government. They're taking over manufacturing. They're doing this stuff. And there was these arguments that were cited in like scientific magazine and stuff, if I remember right, that he quoted in the introduction where he's seeing them already at the tail end of the war when Hayek realized that they were going to win, the Allies were going to win, he was like, oh, crap, look at what the planners are already talking about. They're talking about how do we keep this permanent? How do we maintain this? And the quote that you just set up there or that you just did, I think, tease like the entire theme of this chapter out perfectly, which is, okay, so how do we in, like make these things permanent? How do we get people to be on board with this? Um, and if they're not on board with it, how can we just change the society and change the laws in such a way that there's nothing they can do about it otherwise? Um, and, and I also like, you know, last thing here, what he says is that, like, once again, he, like, again, there's so many really good through lines in this book. And one of them is, if you hold this view, this is the other view that you hold. This is the consequences. And whenever he says there, um, this, it, 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 however, it is, however, the view of, which all those who want the government to direct the economic life must hold, which is, you know, that it being the government has plenary power to do anything. doesn't matter whether it's in wartime or not, they can do this. And so he's saying it's just that logic progression that you mentioned, I think, in the very beginning, uh, our first episode was, look, if you're advocating for this, this is the consequences. It doesn't matter what your intentions are. And, you know, you need to know this because my guess is you don't actually want this thing. Socialists, if they saw the consequences of their ideas, would probably say, no, 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 no just kidding, right? <laughs> um, and so this is one of those times where he tees up one of the ways that, they, uh, that those dystopian um, nightmares become a reality, which is through the perversion of the rule of law and eventually the eradication of the rule of law. Um, actually, so Kevin, how about this? You know, one, one thought I just had is um, we should probably summarize what the rule of law means. And I know that he talks about it in this chapter. Um, but whenever we say the rule of law, what should people be thinking when they hear that? Like, what is the rule of law as Hayek is laying it out here? Yeah. I mean, this gets teased out a little bit in the middle of the chapter as to how it's it's defined quite differently by each side where the rule of law in the context that we're, we're talking about, which is actually going to be covered in this next quote here, is a law that's set up that everyone understands so we can predict each other's behavior. And it's not arbitrary. It's not meant yep. for it. It's not this law for white people. It's not this law for black people, although, you know, at a time, that's certainly how it was set up. It is a law that we all follow no matter what. So we understand the rules of the game effectively. Uh, you cannot, it's very, very difficult to play yep. a game or you should never play a game if you don't know the rules ahead of time. And you certainly should never play a game if the rules are going to change in the middle of it. Right. So that is what we talk about the rule yep. of law. It is not this military rule of law that the, the, some people are on the left are going to say, they're going to hear rule of law and they're going to be like, oh man, this sounds like, you know, the, the uh, 20th century Nazi kind of stuff. You know, they're really strict in the rule of law. And as we're going to see when we progress through this chapter, that is not the case. That is not the way it's defined, uh, yep. especially in the uh, how Hayek defines it. But, you know, I think how you and I understand it's just got to be a rule set in front of us that we understand prior to doing anything else that we can both follow. Yep. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Um, so I totally agree. Do you, do you want to get into that quote that you just kind of alluded to? Yeah. Um, that where he goes over this on page 112. All right. Um, sure. Do uh, you want me to read that? Or do you want, okay. You can go. Um, Nothing distinguishes more clearly conditions in a free country from those in a country under arbitrary government than the observance of the former of the uh, in the former of the great principles known as the rule of law. Stripped of all technicalities, this means that government in all its actions is bound by rules fixed and announced beforehand. Rules which make it possible to foresee with fair certainty how authority will use its course of powers in given circumstances and plan one's individual affairs on the basis of this knowledge. 
Though this ideal can never be perfectly achieved since legislators as well as those to whom the administration of the law is entrusted are fallible men, the essential point that the discretion left to the executive organs wielding coercive power should be reduced as much as possible is clear enough. While every law restricts individual freedom to some extent by altering the means which people may use in the pursuit of their aims, under the rule of law, the government is preventing or prevented from stultifying individual efforts by ad hoc action. Within the known rules of the game, the individual is free to pursue his personal ends and desires, certain that the powers of government will not be used to deliberately frustrate his efforts. So I think um, one way that this kind of, if, if the previous chapter's theme was consensus or coercion, this chapter's theme is something like um, the rules of the game are fixed beforehand versus them being arbitrary. Uh, so either they are something we all know ahead of time or they just are arbitrarily created and imposed and executed um, on individuals on the basis of the circumstance rather than on the basis of something that was agreed upon ahead of time. Does that seem like a fair way to, to tease that theme out a little bit? Yeah. I mean, it's a simple, simple idea, but uh, when you apply it in the real world, it seems to be harder to grasp, right? Because we want, yep. we want some mobility and flexibility in law, right? We, we want to be able to understand different circumstances, but when that gets pushed too far, then all of a sudden the rule of law becomes exactly that arbitrary. And when it becomes arbitrary, yep. I mean, that's, that's not really society you want to inherit. You want to know what you're going into at any given moment, in any given situation to understand, all right, here's the rules of the game. Here's what I can do. Here's what I can't do. Uh, I don't want to have to, you know, go into a place, ask for something and get under threat of arrest. And I think you have some good examples of, you know, how they do it in Britain and then the crazy stuff that they're implementing there um, by these, by these, uh, I don't know if you call them laws, but they're certainly, um, you know, things that'll go on your permanent record, if you will. So it's understanding the rules of the game before you start playing the game, which is so important. And you should never enter a game uh, where the rules can just change right in the middle. And that's, that's yep. uh, kind of the scary part. You can't have an organized society without these rules. And he, he kind of mentioned it a little bit here, you know, the anarchist idea of there's no, no government. Is that possible? No, not really, because there are some liberty, there are some freedoms you have to protect, right? The freedom to life. If someone can just kill you and get away with it, then now that freedom of life is gone. So there needs to be some restrictions. There's just no way to do that without some coercive power, but we need to understand and limit that power to those kind of basic ideas uh, and implement those that that rule of law and not you know branch it out and keep expanding it like so many countries do and, and something we're seeing here in America today. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. And I like what you said about the rules of the game. And so much of that is, I mean, exactly what you said, it's vital to a, a functioning um, civilized society is that I have to know, generally speaking, how you're going to interact or how you're going to act you know, in X circumstance, how the government is going to act in X circumstance. And it becomes impossible to do anything. You can't, I mean, if you want to look at a, um, a situation where you like, what happens if you don't know how anyone's going to act at, at any given time, again, I would go back and look at like how under monarchies or under warlords, like there is no economic growth. There is no upward mobility because you can't plan anything as an individual. You, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know if the king is going to come and take your daughter or take your property. And so it's like, why would you even plan it? I think I, I, this is not my original idea. I can't remember the first place I heard of it. It's like, why would you even plant a, a tree, let alone an orchard of trees, if you don't know if you're going to have that property tomorrow, right? And so it's like, if you don't know what's going to happen, you cannot build these things that are basically the, the foundations of society, um, which is that free economic exchange has to come from having goods and services and those goods and services are things that are planned out ahead of time you know or based on some action that i took beforehand i sat down i opened a shop i created i'm a blacksmith or whatever it is if we're going back a couple centuries um but in order to do any of that i have to know that no one's going to come and take my stuff there's not going to be some random tax collector that's going to come and tax me into oblivion and so the minute you step away from those things where people kind of generally understand even so going to Thomas Sowell, he even talks about how in societies where they had even racist laws where they had like in uh, I think one of the examples was some country in, in Asia where either Jews or Malaysians or something were treated differently 
or in countries in Europe where Jews were treated differently, he one of the arguments he made is like if they understood like that what this the even what the discrimination is going to be obviously not arguing for discrimination but if you at least you understand that like the discrimination is a fixed thing then you can at least plan some something to try and work around the discrimination um so even that is better than something that's completely arbitrary uh where you can't make any plan whatsoever as an individual yeah yeah i mean i i, I like how you get into that you know thomas soul that even if there are discriminatory laws that you understand again the rules of the game ahead of time when when someone, you know, uh, unfortunately in the, the Jim Crow South, when they, when a, a person of color walks past a, a diner that says whites only, they understand that that's probably not the best place to go in there. Or on the other hand, if they organize some sort of protest and go in there, they also understand what's going to happen. They have a general understanding. So it kind of works both ways. Of course, we're both here not advocating for that type of discriminatory law. In fact, we're very explicitly advocating not for it. We'll, we'll get into that later in this chapter, actually. Um, yep. But knowing the rules of the game, even if you know you're going to violate those rules, is actually important as well. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's exactly right. So that seems like a good place to go into that, that next quote there. Sure. I'll take that. Uh, so uh, next quote, quote, the planning authority cannot confine itself to providing opportunities for unknown people to make whatever use of them they like. It cannot tie itself down in advance to general and formal rules which prevent arbitrariness. It must provide the actual needs of people as they arise and then choose deliberately between them. It must consistently decide questions which cannot be answered by formal principles only and, in making these decisions, it must set up distinctions of merit between the needs of different people. And this goes back to the last chapter when he talks about the social scale of values and the hierarchy mm -hmm. of ends. You know, someone in a general planning society, because you use the word planning before as an individual, obviously I'm going to plan my life. I'm not just going to walk around, bump into stuff and be like, figure it out as I go. You want to plan your life as an individual. Yep. But when the state has that power, they need to build this social scale of values to decide what is best, what to prioritize, just like you do in your life. What do I prioritize? But now they got to do it for, you know, hundreds, thousands, millions of people. And that changes the game. Now you got to you got to build this hierarchy of ends and say, all right, what what do we want the ends to be for these certain groups? And that builds in that arbitrariness. Uh, continue to quote then. When the government has to decide how many pigs are to be raised or how many buses are to be run, which coal mines are to operate or what prices shoes should be sold, these decisions cannot be deduced from formal principles or settled for long periods in advance. They, they depend inevitably on the circumstances of the moment and in making such decisions, it will always be necessary to balance one against all other interests of various persons and groups. In the end, somebody's views will have to decide whose interests are more important and these views must become part of the law of the land, a distinction of rank, which the coercive apparatus of government imposes upon the people, end quote. So basically here there needs to, there, there's no clear decision on, on when people say we planning is inevitable, which he kind of starts out this quote is that they always say planning is inevitable. That is not as logical as saying, you know, authoritarian is ine inevitable under planning. That is the, the logical step there. We talk about logic here. Planning is not needed. We, we've seen what society can do, how we can advance without this, this restrictive coercive planning. But when you start adding that planning in there and that planning grows, that, that what do you call a coercive apparatus of government that imposes these plans on people, this, this social rank of values on people, it grows and it's inevitable to go to authoritarianism after planning is implemented. Yep. And, and there's so many things in that quote that I think tease out the, br the broader, I guess, problem here. So whenever he says, so there's just a few words here that I like latched onto mentally. The planning authority cannot confine itself to providing opportunities for unknown people to make whatever use of them as they like. So those who are planning, they see just like giving people equal opportunity or equal access to things should they deem it, you know, desirous, that's, that's being confined. They can't do that. Um, they can't tie themselves down in advance to formal rules, which prevent them from being arbitrary. So there, so understand that the planner sees laws that are laid out ahead of time that people understand that they are also bound to is something that is confining them that ties them down. Um, but instead they have to just make decisions as they come up. It has to be arbitrary. And I like that word. He says, 
we must provide the actual needs of people as they arise. And then uh, again, th that is a generous quote. Like they have to provide for the needs. It's like, no, another way of saying that is they have to address the situation as it, as it arises um, and then choose deliberately between them. So again, this is a situation where it's saying like, since there is no universal scale of values um, that we all have agreed upon ahead of time, that the planner has to come in and deliberately choose and arbitrate between us or, or maybe not even between us when we ask for it, but to say, no, 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 this need is more important than this need. And we're just going to instantiate that in law. And then maybe we'll change something, uh, you know, change something over here. But I mean, again, he's talking about like pigs being grown and, and hats being made and all this other stuff or shoes or whatever. Um, you can't have things set out ahead of time to determine that you have to just be able to, to change it willy nilly um, however you want. And once again, to tie it back to the last chapter, that's going to, going to necessitate coercive power. It's going to, because what happens when the person says, no, I want to make more hats than that, or I want to sell it at this price, or I want to go here and I want to buy this property. Like if that, if that individual desire or the individual plan comes into conflict with the plan of the planners, you know, and the government on the macro level, so to speak, uh, then they have to have the course of power to say, "Sorry, Charlie, you know you're you're going to be you're going to be subject to this just like everyone else." Um, and so I think that it, it, the point is, is it does a good job of saying, like, no, they have to be able to deliberately make these choices, and they see themselves as you know, another way of wording that beginning sentence. There is he's saying equality of opportunity is something that is is prohibitive and restrictive, uh, which again we're going to get into that, but uh, is something that planners see as a bad thing. Um, because it, it, it takes them out of the game, right? Equality of opportunity takes them out of the game. It's like, no, everyone has equal opportunity and then people use it how they might. Um, and it, there's a few quotes later that talks about how this will create inequalities, but, but that's the best possible scenario because the alternative is, is despotism. Um, it, anyway, but yeah, I think that the way that he discusses there, like the, again, just laying out those distinctions, I think is pretty huge. Um, which... I, think, I mean, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, uh, but the no. next part about the blindness uh, is, is, seems like so um, a good place to go. So I think I, this is your bullet point here. True blindness and ignorance to how laws will impact people is vital. The alternative is uh, – uh, actually, I think I typed this. <laughs> did, the alternative yeah. is uh, to know, which is to say know and understand the disparate outcomes. Um, and so he's, he's going to lay out this – the fact that – you have to, like, whenever people create laws, they cannot necessarily know, like, how that's going to impact people differently. Um, if, the, if they do know that, then it's not an, an equal law. It's not an equal thing. Um, so you have to make a law. And, and, he, and he, in that quote that you just read, uh, you know, he, he lays it out there. It's like, yeah, this is, people might have some understanding, but you have to mitigate that as much as possible, where it's like, we don't know what's going to happen here. It's a coin flip. You know, the law has to be like that because the opposite of, is them knowing how it's going to impact people. And if you know those things, then that will change like what you're trying to do there. Um, and so it has to be equally applied to everyone. Um, but this quote, there can be no doubt that planning necessarily involves deliberate discrimination between particular needs of different people. Hey, Kevin, what's that Ibram X. Kendi quote again? I don't know. I haven't read. Um, yeah, no. So that the past discrimination uh, is to make up for present discrimination or no, the present discrimination is to make up for past discrimination and future discrimination is to make up for present discrimination. And it's uh, something I've listed in the sub point behind this, but it, it, it perfectly goes into the idea, right? We, this, this idea of planning didn't die. It evolved. Okay. So you talked about take action. Mm -hmm. That's certainly one of them, but now it has spread into a bunch of different ideologies, including, what is it called? Uh, uh, Anti-racism, anti -racism. right? CRT. This yeah. type of yep. stuff is derived from the same same material, right? And there's a really good quote from a couple chapters yep. back about the the origins of Marxism and how people uh, <laughs> don't even understand the stuff that's coming out of their mouth or, or our mouth or where it's came from. That's the problem with speaking with uh, bullet points or general ideas that you kind of like, so you just want to forward them. When you don't understand where they come from, you'll find out when you do your research. Oh man, this came from something that probably wasn't as good and i kind of want to push myself away from it but then it's too late so i think uh yeah that's this is exactly yeah. what i think of when i when i see a deliberate discrimination is, is candy and that awful awful book that you should never read but read my review of yep 
<laughs> I, I agree and I agree. Uh, so yeah, so he's saying, look, planning. So again, this is socialism. This is the progressivism of today kind of thing. Uh, necessarily involves a li- deliberate discrimination between particular needs of different people and allowing one man to do what another man must be prevented from doing. So this is not equal treatment. Um, it must lay down a legal rule how uh, must lay down by a legal rule how well off particular people shall be and what different people are allowed to have and do. It means a return to the rule of status, a reversal of the movement of progressive societies, which in the famous phrase of Sir Henry Maine has hitherto been a movement from status to contract. Indeed, the rule of law more than the rule of contract should probably be regarded as the true opposite of the rule of status. It is the rule of law in the sense of the rule of formal law, the absence of legal privileges of particular people designated by authority, which safeguards that equality before the law, which is the opposite of arbitrary government. So again, there's that dichotomy. If you have a a neutral principle of the law where it's equally applied to people, that's the opposite of arbitrariness. That's the opposite of planning. And, And I think he lays out here another good point where it's like this going back to a rule of status, like it was... If I'm a lord or a noble in yeah, some house, yeah, that's exactly right. So I have these special privileges, and there was no upward mobility in these things. Like the closest you would get is if the king, you know, his son, for whatever reason, wound up taking your daughter as a concubine or something, you know what I mean? Or if you're in the gladiatorial games <laughs> and you can raise up, you know, that way, Maximus, but it's like those are not preferable. So this rule of status is like, you're always going to be in whatever hierarchy you're in. Um, and it's like, I'm better than you based on these immutable principles. Sounds familiar. Um, or I have special privileges based on these immutable principles. Sound familiar. And so he's saying this is regressive. This is taking us back to the rule of status. It's a reversal of the rule of contract. So he goes, and there's even a progression there where it's like rule of status, bad. Rule of contract is like, we both agree to these things, but we might still have different statuses. And rule of law is the laws of the land are laid down in such a way that they apply to the government and people equally. So it's just, if you can navigate that, you can rise or fall based on your own decisions, but it's not going to be on the basis of some outside force um, that that causes that. Yeah. Whenever I think of uh, the rule of status, you know, I think that feudalism of, of the lords and I always think of the the office scene where Michael Scott, you know, Phyllis is about to get married. I think it's Phyllis, and Michael Scott yells <laughs> "Prima nocta," <laughs> and he doesn't understand what it means. But um, <laughs> for some reason, this makes me think of that when it comes to the, the feudalism. But I mean, it, that, that's a great point, and you know, I've written down here, and I think we covered this uh, again. Might have been the introduction, but the the kind of brilliance of understanding that we're not progressing, we're regressing. This is a reversal. Like, right? You quite literally uses the reversal. Uh, toward the rule of status, which is, you know, progressives imagine themselves as progressing past or transcending the current liberal society. You know, they, they want, they, they claim to want to be liberal, but like we said at the beginning, they don't understand what that word means, but they want to go to a post-capitalist, a, a post-Christian, um, you know, post-modern society, and they don't under, understand they're regressing. They're regressing to a pre-capitalist, pre-modern, pre-Christian society, which is not something we want to live in. OK, it, yep. it, I mean, feudalism quite literally was the lords that was the lords saying, well, these peasants, it's not, you know, through fault of their own. They're just peasants. They don't understand. They treated them like children. It's like they don't understand, you know, how to live mm-hmm. for themselves. Does that sound familiar? Does that not sound like our, our political yep. betters, our, our intellectuals of today? I mean, that is what planning is. Yep. That's a central part of planning. It is not progression. It is regression. They want to go back to where yep. power was centralized. And power to just infantilizing the population. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's just, again, switched in some people's brains. And normally it's going to be the young people who are very idealistic who think, you know, this is postmodern. It is. It's like, well, read a history book and you will quickly realize it's, it's not, this is how it used yep. to be. And you want to go back there. And that's not a society that any of us should want to live in. Yeah. And, and I think it's telling by the way that, you know, the idea that there is just so many things that are kind of in the in the modern zeitgeist and the progressive lexicon that are are so crazy, you know, that even if we went back to the '90s and someone said, "Yeah, they're advocating for discrimination," it, you know, in the in the name of of equality, they're advocating for 
um, racial preferences or advocating for segregation in a lot of these places in the name of equality, people would say, are you insane? Like, what are you talking about? Um, and the fact that, I, I mean, one, again, it just speaks to the prescience of Hayek here. He's talking about like, this is going to require discrimination to do this. And what do we have? It's becoming, it's part of the lexicon now and part of a lot of these policies where it's like, uh, we're going to have, here's one of those where they use different words. We're going to have uh, spaces you know, there's this space for people of color, this space for these people. We have to have spaces that are for these people. It's like, that's, that's segregation dipshit. Like there, that is what that is. Like, you're just, you know, don't try to church it up. Your daddy must have really hated you naming you Joe Dirt. And so it's like, <laughs> this is the same thing. Like you're just calling it something different. Um, and so it's like, the, it just blows my mind, I guess, is, is as an aside that, it, that we have all these ideas that, I was pretty sure that we'd all agreed were evil, <laughs> like, you know, discrimination and segregation and, and treating people differently based on immutable characteristics. And now they're becoming, it's like, uh, no, actually, it, you know, you're, you're a bigot. If you don't do it, you're, you're a, you're a transphobe. If you don't want to have sex with a, a, a person with a penis, you know, if you're a heterosexual male or female, you know, whatever you're, you know, all these things where it's like, this is crazy shit, but, th but this is what this ideology does. Yeah. Now we're banned on YouTube. Thanks. Um, yeah. I mean, well, first I thought this was I a class. I thought this was a classy podcast and you quoted Joe dirt. Um, <laughs> <Dear that Tay. laughs> that went out the window, but I mean, uh, you, you made a good point. I mean, are we getting closer or further away from Jim Crow? If we were to implement the policies that, that Ibram Kendi wants. Yeah. Closer, I mean, for sure. That, this is the apartheid. perfect example. Apartheid. Yeah, yeah. This is a perfect example. I mean, they ironically use apartheid, um, <laughs> applying it to other people. But um, I mean, this is a perfect example of how to revert backwards. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. uh, you know I explained uh, a few episodes ago where it's you know they're they're they think they're doing a one eighty on racism, but they're just doing a three sixty on racism. They're twirling around and looking at the same racist object yeah. and they're like, hey, anti racist. So it's it's uh, you know I don't. Some people, it's like, I don't know. Are you doing this on purpose? Was this like a joke? Am I unpunked? Like, what? When, where is Aston Kutcher going to come out? And it's it just never happens, unfortunately. Well, at least never happened yet. What, what's going to happen at the end of 2021? <laughs> pandemic's over. Aston Kutcher coming out. No, I don't think it's going to happen, but we can all hope. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I don't to get generally that, hope to see Ashton Kutcher yeah, in my day-to-day -day life. But, I, know. <laughs> I just think of like Kevin Malone when I think of Ashton Kutcher, but... Um, yeah. Uh, so do you mind if we get to the next part? What? No, I'm thinking of the Kevin Malone it? thing you're talking about. And he says, when he puts on the toupee and say, it's not Ashton Kutcher. What is that office, in? What is Kevin Malone. Oh, Kevin. Oh. Yeah. Kevin. Malone. I was thinking of like real people. And so I'm like, yeah. okay. Because in person. my mind, I was thinking like Demi Moore and like the butterfly <laughs> effect and that 70s show. And I'm like, okay. No. Is it Brian Kevin Bob Garner? There we go. I think that's the actor's name. <laughs> Keep Sorry. going. I'm just like Keep all in the office quote. quotes. All right. So no, I love it. It's great. Um, so yeah, the next one gets really, I mean, this might be my favorite quote that we have bolded here um, because it perfectly encompasses, I mean, basic economics. This, this is where this is very Thomas soul here, which is why I love mm -hmm. it. But again, one of the, the people who influenced Thomas soul, one of the people who influenced uh, George Orwell Hayek. I mean, this yep. guy, again, the logic yep. center of the brains of a lot of these brilliant people. So um Quote, a necessary and only apparently paradoxical result of this is, this is that formal equality before the law is in conflict and in fact incomparable with any activity of government deliberately aiming at material or substantive, substantive equality of different people and that any policy aiming directly at a substantive, substantive woo, ideal of distribu distributive uh, justice must lead to the destruction of the rule of law. To produce the same result for different people, it is necessary to treat them differently, to give different people the same object, objective opportunities is not to give them the same subjective chance. I'm just going to reread those two lines real fast. Yes, please. Yeah. To, <laughs> I was <gonna> produ suggest <laughs> to produce that same result for different people, it is necessary to treat them differently, to give different people the same objective opportunities is not to give them the same subjective chance it cannot be denied that the rule of law produces economic inequality all that can be claimed for it 
is that this inequality is not designed to affect particular people in a particular way. It is very significant and characteristic that socialists and Nazis have always protested against merely formal justice, that they have always objected to the rule, which the no, wait, always objected to the law, which had no views on how well off particular people ought to be. And that they have always demanded a socialization of law, attacked the independence of judges, and at the same time given their support to all such movements as the Verrichtenschule, which just stands as German for free law, which undermine the rule of law, end quote. So right here, we already talked about that, that basic idea that's a common in, in Thomas Sowell and all these other great economists that equality of opportunity produces an inequality of outcome. It's just, yep. just how it works. People are too diverse. They're too different. They have too many different values. We talked about scale of values. You know, the government trying to bring this into a large scale of values makes the assumption that we all have the same. Guess what? We don't all have the same values. So why would we all have the same outcomes given similar opportunities? Right. There's a there's a, you know, a book, uh, The Quest for Cosmic Justice by Thomas Sowell, where he talks about people don't have the same equality of opportunities because of cosmic injustices. And that's somehow where the government needs to step in to to equalize those injustices. Well, in a, in a world that you do not want this coercive centralized power, you have to kind of deal a bit more with those cosmic injustices. But we still as a, a, a privileged society and in a real true way of saying privilege, which, again, we'll get to later, um, you know, those barriers are not as tall as they'd be in many other countries. So basically, yep. right, the equality of opportunity produces inequality of outcome, but equality of outcome demands inequality of opportunity under the law. That is arbitrary yep. rules, it's arbitrary power. So, yep. I, you know, this is the central thesis here. And then also the next part with the Nazis, uh, which if you want to take that, you know, the Nazis, as people think, you know, the rule of law, that's, that's very, uh, you know, that feels like a Nazi would say that. No, they hate the rule of law. Yep. Very, very much against it. Very much against it. Yeah, and the the part here where he talks about how like it's understand it's important to understand this is a paradox or it sounds paradoxical to say if you treat people equally you'll have unequal outcomes. But another way of thinking about that is if you allow people to operate as individuals due to their own differing and respective, like you said, like hierarchies of values, they will have unequal outcomes. Right. Like if you allow people to pursue whatever they want, then whatever they want is going to have different outcomes. Right. It's going to be entirely different. And so you're going to have to force like to you're going to have to apply force and treat people differently if you want to achieve equal outcomes. And the crazy thing is, is, again, this is like with any of these things, you know, if you look at the policies where they're moving like AP math and, and other AP classes in schools, whenever you are forcing equal outcomes, all it does is lower standards to the bottom. Everyone ends up equally poor, equally miserable, equally enslaved. Um, you're not going to make everyone equally wealthy, equally productive, right? And and so they it, all it is is a lowering of standards through force. And that's the the Harrison Bergeron thing where it's like, no, you're not going to bring people up. You can only force other people down in order to achieve equality. And you can even do this. Um, man, oh, I'm trying to remember what the context was. I th it might have been even just uh, the the collegiate ministry I was part of where we would do an exercise where it's like one person standing on a chair, another person's on the ground, they lock arms, and the person on the ground tries to pull down and the person on the chair tries to pull up. And it's like, which one is going to succeed or more likely to succeed? It's like it, you're going to – the person on the ground is going to pull the other person down way before the person on top pulls them up. And, and that's how it, like the way even no child left behind is a, is a example of that where it's like, anytime you try to equalize outcomes is my point is that you always have to, everything gets lowered. It doesn't bring everyone up. Um, that's what happens whenever you take someone. I, I think Peterson quotes this is if you have someone who's like not a very good worker or whatever, and a, and a, maybe some kind of site manager tries to put them on a team with a bunch of people who are really good workers, is it ends up bringing the productivity of that team down. They don't raise the one up. And so it's like you have to have a thing where people have equal opportunity because you're always going to have people that do not want to act on that opportunity. I go back to the people I picked up in my car who were passing code red mountain dew with everclear in it or whatever you know that just want to be homeless it's like how are you going to lift that person up to be equal as someone making two hundred thousand dollars a year on the basis of labor you're not you're only going to be able to bring people down and that's what this is um is that it's unequal treatment of people that ends up driving everything down 
Um, do you think that this would be a good time to get into some of these contemporary examples of the of the different and disparate outcomes? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to sa save some of that that Great Britain stuff uh, for whenever we get to that part here a little bit later. But um, so for the folks at home, again to quote Norm Macdonald, like the one of the purposes of what we're doing here is to it's not just to talk about a book that's really interesting or really prescient or just that scares the shit out of you if you understand it. It's to try and marry this onto our our contemporary context and say, okay, he lays out implications. He lays out logical progression here of these ideas um, and where they lead to, aka serfdom. And so it's like, how, why is that relevant? Well, it's relevant because we're seeing a lot of these things play out today. And so in the context here where he's talking about, like, you're going to have to treat people differently if you want to force these equal outcomes, you know, because you're naive to, to give the quote from, uh, was it Adam Smith in at the or John Stuart Mill, I think it was Adam Smith, wasn't it at the beginning of the last chapter where it's like only a fool would think that they could even do this. Yeah, um, and so like if you're if you're foolish enough to think that you can try to force this, these kind of changes, um, you know, this is where this leads. But but here's some some examples of this happening today in our country, in the United States. You know, if you're if you're not in the US, that's fine. Um, but these are happening in other places, even worse, to be honest. Um, so here's an example. So, uh, advancing racial equity in California state government, a strategic analysis of recommendations to institutionalize racial equity in California state government. So this is a, a .org website. This is something they're doing in California right now. So racial equity, Kevin, tell the folks home racial equity. What is, how is equity different from equality and how might that be exactly what Hayek just mentioned here? Yeah, this is a very Orwellian trick where they flipped it out and like everyone just agreed, okay, it looks good. I mean, it's close enough. You know, equality and equity, they kind of sound the same, right? But equality, depending on the context in which you're using it, means normally equality of opportunity. Like we're treated equally. You and I are treated equally. Uh, you know, me and, and someone who's of a different color, different race, are treated equally. But equity means we have equitable outcomes, right? That means this is something that is, is planned, if you will. The ends are planned. Um, so when they flop out racial equality, great thing. Martin Luther King wanted racial equality. Did he want racial yep. equity? I, I don't think he would, he would totally agree with that, especially if you explained it and expand it the way uh, that it's actually, you know, uh, thought through here where it's like, okay, we want, you know, if, if uh, we have a local government, it must directly represent the percentage uh, breakdown of the racial makeup of whatever, uh, you know, whatever place that that person is governing or that, that body is governing. And as Thomas Sowell explains in a couple of his books, um, uh, that's not the way any place in the world has it set up unless it's forced. But again, yep. forced, now you're inviting all this coercion in the door. Right? You, you yep. talked about institutionalized. Institutionalized, a key word there. That means you are putting this in the system to live forever. It is yep. in there. You cannot reverse it, right? You might be able to democratically institutionalize it, but once it's in there, it ain't leaving. So it's very what's important that, you know those words, yeah. What's ironic there is they're saying institutionalized racial equity in California state government in the name of reducing institutionalized racism. It's like we're going to put in institutionalized racism in order to combat institutionalized racism. So that's the logic there. And, and what, what way should you – if it's – if sorry. To, but no, you're fine. If you have an institution that is ingrained with racism, why would you then trust that institution and give them more power to get rid of it? I mean, yep. what's the problem here? Is it just the people running the institution? Is it just because it's not you running it? It's not you running the show that it's not working? Or is it the institution inherently corrupt itself? And when you give it more power, it just builds more corruption. So why are yep. you trying to solve this problem with the problem itself? It yeah, why happen. should we trust the people who are talking about how racist they are to solve racism? It's like, you just <laughs> told me you're racist. <laughs> like You've, you've uh, effectively opted out of the conversation, asshole. <laughs> like, that's not, like, hey, I'm a racist. Give me more power so I can solve racism. Right. Um, it might be worth it sometime to show that, I mean, crazy thing that Kamala Harris tweeted out the night before the election about a difference between equality and equity. You know, it has those flowers and raising people up to the top of a mountain and all that other dystopian bullshit. Um, so people understand that you don't talk about institutionalized, you know, um, whatever role she's playing in anything, uh, you know, she's the vice president of the United States, you know, and, and she's, this, I mean, this is about as instantiated as it's going to get um, in our government. So here, here's another thing about, so if you go to ca.gov, governing for racial equity, California's capital collaborative on race and equity. So these are things that people can all look up. If you just type in California race equity, 
like you can see the policies they're putting in and all of the crazy amounts of tax dollars uh, that they're going to be putting forth to for these things. And at the the U.S. Uh, federal government level, you know, again, we have this benevolent uh, leader in the White House. Joe Biden is very wise. He's definitely the one in charge of the government right now. I don't let anyone tell you anything different. Um, all there mentally for sure. So we have these uh, executive orders. So WhiteHouse.gov, um, briefing rooms. These are presidential actives or actions. Um, this is an executive order advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government. So promoting equitable delivery of government benefits and equitable opportunities. Well, hold on a second. What's the opposite of equal opportunity? Equitable opportunity, which is force. And I love the wording here. Government are, programs are designed to serve all eligible individuals. And government contracting and procurement of opportunities should be available on an equal basis to all eligible providers of goods and services. <laughs> so again, it's like, this is e going to be equal a totally to all equal eligible. thing. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's amazing. So what, what determines your eligibility? Well, whatever batshit crazy, uh, you know, criteria we laid forth at a time. It's arbitrary. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's like the under, you know, to use your Jim Crow example, it's like, look, every place that was segregated that was whites only provided equal opportunity and access to all eligible customers right like yeah. that's the that's how they could say that right could you could you put like a note i'm just like picturing now uh, in a disgusting <laughs> picture of like all eligible whites only <laughs> yep. allowed in this yeah. diner it's like oh if you if you said that i mean are, i mean they were already democrats yep. but i mean are you woke, woke <laughs> democrats now like like it's i don't i don't understand the logic well yeah but it's amazing. but it is that but that's the same wording, right? So they would say, look, anyone can go in here as long as they're eligible, whites only. You know, and so yeah. this is the same kind of ideology.